morning. Thank you. Well, welcome to our second part of the series that we're teaching in a minute called From Great to Good. And there's a whole host of areas that we want to talk about and engage with when we're teaching this series. But this journey that tr tries to resist the sort of culture of obsession with greatness that we have in society and, and listen to the, the biblical pursuit of goodness. Uh, I felt to me like once we've sort of intro the series and got it started, a great place to start is around questions of, of justice, uh, questions perhaps of injustice and questions of reconciliation. Um, these are issues that often, I think, historically, the church has sort of left till later on in its conversation. But I want to put them up front because I think justice is at the heart of the pursuit of goodness. If we're going to be good, it has to work in, in the world that we live in. And so to have that conversation today, really, really privileged to be joined by uh, my friend, Holly Fortier, who I have had so many exceptionally good conversations with uh, since, since I've got to know her and have invited Holly to, uh, to, to come and be part of our conversation uh, today. So welcome, Holly. Yeah, thank you for having me. Excited to be here. Uh, so, so you um, are, well, you've got such a fascinating story that I almost just want to say, uh, you know, tell me a little bit about yourself um, and, and your, yeah, what it is that you do. Um, and, and so that we can just get to know you a, a tiny little bit uh, as we kind of launch into this conversation about goodness in the subject of justice and reconciliation. Yeah, it's my favorite topic. Um, so let's start off with a land acknowledgement because, you know, we always invite people to acknowledge whose traditional territory you're on. Canada mm -hmm. is a Mohawk word, which means our home. Kanata is a Cree word in my language, which means clean and pure. So all of Canada is traditional territory. And so where we now live, work, and play, and today where we worship, we know that this has been uh, Indigenous land for time immemorial. Mm -hmm. Canada's been here for a few hundred years, but it's always beautiful to acknowledge whose traditional territory you're on. So mm -hmm. Westside King's Church is on the traditional territory of the Blackfoot, the Sotina, and the Stony Nakoda. And so we honor ancestral territory. And so I'm actually from Fort Mackay First Nation in Northern Alberta. And I have, um, we are Korean Dene in my community. And I have been going to Westside, believe it or not, ever since the very first service. And my daughter goes there and my son-in-law and my granddaughter. So we have three generations of us attending Westside. It's our church. We love it. And uh, we love that the church is doing this in honor of, you know, building right relations in reconciliation efforts. And I'm really proud of you for doing that. So I do, um, I have two businesses. I do Indigenous awareness training. So I, this is my thing. I give education, information, inspiration in, you know, the first Canadians and all other Canadians that we can get along well. And also I'm a filmmaker because I can speak, but film has a further reach. And so basically my two businesses are just storytelling and, you know, helping us to bridge that gap. And that's, and that's beautiful. Uh, it's beautiful work that you do, Holly. I've been privileged enough to see some of the films that you've, uh, that you've made and, and I love them. And, and every conversation I have with you, I, um, I just learn so much and I, uh, I, I feel bad so often, Holly, cause I, I feel like uh, we have these conversations and, and I've, I've just kind of turned you into my teacher for the day. And, uh, uh, but, uh, but part of that excitement for me in our conversations was to say, Oh, well, I, I want more people to hear these conversations. Cause, because I feel like as, as a, well, you know, as, as a modern settler in Canada, somebody who's only been here for a few years, there's so much that I need to learn and, and I want to learn well. And, and then as a, as a Christian who believes that reconciliation is at the core of the gospel of Jesus and, and then, you know, I land in Canada and start to learn about this, this complex and, and, and 
ugly, and I don't want to say this under Stacey, but I'm thinking about the title of our series, this not good history that we have. Oh. Um, and and I'm, I'm thinking, wow, I, I want to, I need to learn about this and understand this so that, you know, I can hopefully be good uh, as somebody that, that has moved to this to this beautiful country uh, that, that that I now raise my own daughter in and uh, and try to work out my faith in Jesus mm -hmm. in the midst of that complexity. So uh, so I've been hugely appreciative of, of what you've helped and, and, and brought to me in that. Mm, thank you. The same. You're my teacher, you know, so I'm very honored that I can help you. It's 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 the it's the well it's a good friendship, isn't it? So I, yeah, I appreciate it so much. Um, now, question that I was thinking about was when we started this series last week. Um, I referenced uh, a text from Ephesians in Ephesians chapter mm -hmm. two, and I just referenced verse ten in the series, which is kind of rooting into uh, questions of. Of God's creation, of, of God as creator, as, as, as God as sustainer. Um, and, and Paul, he writes to this church in Ephesus and he says, we are God's handiwork. Um, and I love that word, actually, because in, in the Greek that Paul writes, he uses this word which is rooted in this Greek term poeo, which is where in English we get the word poetry from. Right, so I, I love this idea of, of of us as gods, as humans, as God's poetry. Uh, you know that God has has formed us and shaped us and done uh, so much uh, with us in that sense. So we're God's handiwork, uh, and then but Paul doesn't leave it there. He says we're created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So uh, I love this idea that God's doing these this poetic work with us, and He wants us to do to do good. But whenever I read that passage in Ephesians, I'm always aware of the fact that there's more to that passage. And, and so when I came away from my sermon on uh, Sunday and I thought, wow, OK, there's so much more that we need to talk about around that verse. And, and I want to sort of raise it here because I think it sets us up a little bit for the conversation that we're having. Because Paul says, OK, so we're God's handiwork. We're created to do good works. But then... <laughs> He goes on in the following verses. I'm just going to read this, Holly, um, for us just now from verses uh, 11 of Ephesians chapter 2. Paul says, Therefore, remember that formerly you who were Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands. And this, so this is Paul. It just dived into the big separation of his day, which is a separation between Jewish people and non-Jewish people. But then he says this, remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenant of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Now, again, interrupt myself here a moment. Paul's talking about this very complex journey where, he re where he's trying to help people understand that Jesus has come near to Whoever we are, wherever we are, Jesus has has come near to us. But the challenge that Paul's got is there's a group of people who think that basically based on who they are, they're closer to Jesus than everybody else. Right? And so uh, I don't know that we can imagine that ever being the case. Right? <laughs> but, but, but that's sort of the situation. It's like history repeats itself. Right? And then Paul in verse 14 of Ephesians chapter 2, he says this, For he is our peace. Who has made the two groups one, has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death the hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him, we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Now, a lot in that text and a lot that we could sort of, you know, engage with. But, but when I hear a text like that and we think about the language of reconciliation, we think about the language of division, injustice, I'm curious as to what, as to what you think of a text like that you, you know you've told us a tiny little bit about your story long-term journey with us as a church um what do you what do you think when you hear a text like ephesians 2 
I love it. Um, it just speaks volumes to me. Uh, I became a Christian in 1982. Prior to that, we had nothing to do with the church. And when I became a Christian, I would read scriptures like that. And it was so comforting to me that I am God's handiwork. You know, it starts off in Genesis 1. I am made in the image of God. If you look all the way to Revelation uh, 7, it says every tribe, every people, every language is going to be at the throne of God. And so I realized that when I became a Christian that, you know, what you're speaking right now, that there is a creator that created me and, and I loved it. And I became a Christian and my life totally changed. But the response to me, you know, from the church, I have to admit, there was a lot of negative um, comments mm -hmm. like, you know, there was generational curses that I had to, you know, get rid of um, witchcraft, which was just art, indigenous art. And a lot of people, you know, were really hard on me. It was almost like they were saying either or, like it was op opposing, like you're First Nation or you're Christian, but I can be a First Nation woman who, you know, is a believer and follower of Christ. And so that didn't really sit well with me, this big chasm that was being separated um, between the two, because I would read scriptures like that, that were just so inviting and comforting. And so I do realize that through that journey, um, you know, I'm just really happy to, that's why even this conversation is so wonderful for me, because now I can express this. And mm -hmm. it's such an honor, you know, just missiologists will agree that despite 500 years of mission work, indigenous people, only two to 5% of us are followers of Jesus because there was bad representation. And so, you know, I think that moving forward, if we have these authentic conversations that can change. Mm. I, I mean, it makes me so sad to hear aspects of your story when we've talked about this in the past. And I think, man, that's like, it, it, it's, it's so sad that you were talking about something that happened in 1982. And Paul, a couple of thousand years beforehand, is writing about exactly this situation. That, that what happens, I think, is we, we over-spiritualize the gospel. So the gospel is just about going to heaven when we die. And therefore... The gospel has nothing to say about what happens in our day-to-day -day lives um, and nothing to say about our race or ethnicity or the geography of where we were born or, or anything like that. The environment, our care for the world, all these things get sort of ignored. And what you see so often is then a gospel which feels more like assimilation than it does uh, a call to follow Jesus in our, in our lives. And so the situation that Paul's dealing with is... How do Jewish people find and follow Jesus? And how do non-Jewish people find and follow Jesus? And the situation that he's seeing is one group of people going, oh no, you have to leave that way of, you know, that ethnicity or that behavior and join this one. And Paul so often is saying, no, that's not what it says at all. Um, and, and so I just find so often, I, I, I find your story amazing that despite that journey that you went through, uh, that you still chose to, to sort of hold on to Jesus in that. And, uh, and, and, and despite people telling you the aspects of your culture, aspects of just the simplicity of, you know, just being who you were that, that attach negative ideas to, that must be so painful. And yet, and yet you still sort of held around in that, you know, believing that, that Jesus had a different way of being with you. And I, I just, I want to honor that. And also just, I feel so bad that you had to journey with that. Well, thank you. You know, it's ethnocentrism where it says your, you know, society or culture belief system is superior to others. And we actually don't do the gospel, any beauty or justice when we wrap it in one way, because, you know, we have to celebrate all of this. And 
Um, you know, especially when we're thinking of reconciliation with Indigenous people, the church has got to do different, for sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I was reading just recently uh, a piece by a couple of scholars who were talking about how one of the roles of the church has, has is to separate itself from that historical behavior of superiority, which was to not simply say, hey, we want to talk about Jesus, but alongside Jesus came this belief that that we're better than everybody else, our culture, our background, and, and, and the European settlers that moved to North America definitely brought a sense of superiority with them. But the danger for that, that I'm beginning to understand is they've left that superiority behind. There's still this sense that, that this sort of you know, white European way of thinking is the right one all the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, I think the thing in um, Canada, you know, we've been really negligent on learning, you know, the true history of Indigenous people mm -hmm. in Canada. And so people are not, you know, it seems so distant from the average mm -hmm. Canadian. So something like when they find the unmarked graves at former residential school sites, People are like, wait, what? I've never heard of this. And, you know, honestly, I've taught thousands and thousands of people across Canada. And I've had thousands and thousands of people say, I didn't know that. I had no idea. And so it's, you know, that education is the key. And we have to have more of that. Yes. And it's interesting, again, you know, I, I you know, I did a lot of my academic study in in paul as, as you know and so I've, I've got this ephesians 2 text hanging over my head as i'm you know as i'm talking to you just now and i'm thinking about paul's place that he worked a lot of reconciliation was around the table uh, that he he would when you listen to paul talk about the communion table or the eucharist table depending what Christian tradition someone's from, they'll hear it referred to as differently. And Paul's idea seems to have been that when we came around the one table, we found our unity in Christ. Um, and the phrase that gets used a lot amongst academics is what that I really like is that what Paul doesn't push is uniformity, but that he, mm -hmm. he invites us to a unity in diversity. Uh, so, so there's something about coming to the table as you are, and who you are and being welcomed there um, to, to talk as equals. And I feel like that's important because in, in order to talk about goodness, both in the church, you know, in Canada as a nation, it feels like we've got to look through and deal with some, some pretty non-good stuff. <laughs> and and I'm, I'm using yeah. the term not good on purpose, because it feels a little awkward, but but I want to draw that contrast between you know the good that we're called to and the not good that we're called to. Um, and now you said something to me uh, recently, which I immediately wrote down and said, Holly, I'm going to ask you about that. But you had this phrase where you said racism is difficult to talk about because it feels like your goodness is being attacked, and uh, yeah. and I'd love to have you explore that a little bit because. I want us to talk about racism because I don't think the way forward for reconciliation is just to say, well, that was the past. Let's move into the future. We, we need to deal with the things, some of the things that would happen. But when you made that phrase, racism is difficult to talk about because it feels like your goodness is being attacked. I thought it so, it so got to the heart of why it can be difficult as a white settler to address these issues because everything in me wants to say, oh no, I think I'm a good person, Holly. I, I don't, I wasn't part of all of this stuff. Um, and therefore trying to abdicate my responsibility in the field of reconciliation. So that, that's enough for me. Do you want to unpack that a little? I mean, I realize I said a lot of words there, but do you want to unpack that statement a little bit with us? Yeah. I, you know, when we talk about good, Canadians are good. We're known globally for being nice. But if we take a real look at the true history, 
we'll re- we realize that we're not that good and nice. And so in order to move forward, we do need to know where we come from. And we have to take a step back and look because we've been really negligent in Canada on sharing that history. You know, we talk about, you know, um, what we call indigenous way of knowing and being where we lived off the land, you know, all of our food, shelter, clothing, tools, toys, medicines, everything came from the land. And we were well established before European contact. We had government, politics, warrior societies, art, science, architecture, medicine. We were well established. We call that indigenous way of knowing and being. And that's where most of our education has been focused on because, you know, it's so beautiful and romantic and, you know, that rich culture. And most of us still identify with that. That's where the root of our beauty of who we are came from. But, you know, when Europeans first came over, they couldn't live in one of the harshest countries in the world without assistance. We were like, okay, dude, you need to change your shoes and your clothing because you're going to get sick. And if you get sick, all the medicines come from the land. Here's your food sources. Um, This is how you live. And so Europeans depended on First Nations. And that was the original relationship. Now, of course, it's changed. And, you know, it was severed. And people don't realize that 150 years of colonization and unilateral decision-making by the federal government has really altered that relationship. And so what happened was when Europeans came over, so fur traders, missionaries, explorers, all of them, then what happened was the taking up of the land, especially with the national dream. The CP rail was going across Canada. And they said, you know what? The Indians, back then they call us Indians, the Indians are in the way of development so of the Western expansion. So they called it the Indian problem. So they started to take us and uproot us, relocate us to Indian reserves. And, you know, the reserve system changed everything for us. And then what happened from there is they said the best way to assimilate the Indians into Canada is we will take the children and we will raise the children. So they opened up 139 Indian residential schools in Canada and They were operated by church organizations, and it was the RCMP that started to go and, you know, take the children and escort them to the schools. Mm -hmm. So the government, the RCMP, and the churches, they were all in it together. And we still have a severed relationship with all three groups. Mm -hmm. And there really needs big efforts in those three groups in reconciliation. But, you know, what happened in residential schools is horrific that children were neglected and abused. Um, And the stories are true that we're hearing, you know. And what happened from that is little kids tried to run home back to their families. And then they, what they actually did is many of the children died, but they would go try to find the kids, bring them back and severely punish them so that they could be shown, you know, made an example. Don't run away because this is how we're going to punish you. So they made it the law. If you're an Indian child aged 6 to 16, it was mandatory by law for you to attend Indian residential school. So if we think of there's a knock at the door and the RCMP come and get your children, you had no choice. And so... You know, the stories of Indian residential school are so disturbing, um, and it's not ancient history. The last residential school in Canada closed in 1996. My mother um, lived a traditional way of life on the land, was totally loved, and the RCMP came to her community and took them by force. There was no conversation like, do you, you know, we're going to take your children. This is what's going to happen. This is a plan. This is where they'll be. No, it was by force that they took them and the whole community grieved. You can't imagine those left behind. And then all the children were told, if you ever see anybody coming down the river again, because it was so remote, there's no roads back mm-hmm. then up north, You have to run and hide. So you see all this anger and hatred built. So my mom spent 13 years at a residential school where 
her family and community had no idea where she was and she didn't know where home was. But here's the thing, when you're 18, your funding gets cut off. So she got put on a bus and her bus ticket takes her to Edmonton. My mom said that was a nightmare because there was nothing set up for them. She gets dropped off. She'd been 13 years in this mission compound. All of a sudden she's in this big city, there's predators. The police were charging a vagrancy. She has no money to secure um, a safe place and or pay for fines so then they parent us so the legacy continues right and so you know I think that say for example my mom and I we're still impacted by the legacy but I think for you know my daughter my granddaughters that's a change and this is our story. And I think, especially as a church, we have to have compassion that this is what happened. And it's a hard truth. It's a hard lesson, you know, to hear this. It can be disturbing. And going back, racism is an uncomfortable conversation because it feels like your goodness is being attacked. Like, And even a racist will say, I'm not racist. Like, I'm not wearing a white hood. I'm not a racist. But... You know, I think that we have to lean into this conversation and perhaps let's use the words, I want to be actively anti-racist. Let's, you know, start moving forward in that and lean into these uncomfortable conversations because that's how we're going to um, move forward. I, um, I mean, when I listen to you talk, it, it does something that, I think it feels important to identify how how systemic and kind of institutional you know the racism is that we're talking about and and I know that when the the word like or the phrase systemic racism has is very triggering for some people and people immediately hear that idea and they connect it I would say they connect it to, to the wrong things and, and like I say we then start to feel uh, attacked uh, I read this quote just recently by Michael Emerson who says that there's a tendency to see racism as individual acts so so when somebody so when, when, when a white person uh, like myself says well I'm not racist and I don't I'm not involved in racism. What I mean is that me individually, this is how I see my life. Whereas what Emerson's a sociologist, he says what you tend to see if you talk to people of color is that racism comes from power, it comes from systems, it comes from structures and institutions that are in place that are way more complex than just one person's individual behavior. Um, and as you tell your story, you hear that, that Canada intentionally had a series of systems put together which were, were racist, were oppressive, were, were deeply, deeply prejudiced. And so unpicking that is much more complex than just being some people that don't wish to be racist themselves. Uh, and forgive me, I'm probably explaining that really badly, but I feel like it's worth identifying. What I'm hearing you say is an explanation of how we do have a systemic problem that hasn't yet been put back together properly. Yeah, you know, even some of our leaders in Canada um, have said there's no such thing as systemic racism. Even church leaders have said that. But, you know, when we think of it, there has been systems in place. I would invite every Canadian to understand the Indian Act. Please study it. Um, this is where they separated us from Canada. So there's all of Canada, and then there was Indians under the Canadian Indian Act. So we're the only ethnicity in all of Canada that have a government department. And there was mm -hmm. systems in there that were oppressive. And if you read them, like we couldn't um, go to university, any post-secondary institution. Um, we couldn't get a job or start a business. You know, there was so many oppressive systems that were in place, including residential school. That was a system that was in place. And so there's some language that people feel a little bit hesitant or their reaction is like, you know, they just don't want to accept it. Like, for example, white privilege. 
And I have so many friends that are like, you know, so nice. They're like, I don't think of myself better than you, or we're not privileged. My family came over. We worked really hard. Well, that's money privilege. That's class privilege. That's not color or skin privilege. Cause we have situations where, because the way I look, um, I, you know, have people approaching me and saying different things to me, like following me around in a store. Cause I look suspect or, mm-hmm. you know, not letting me have, um, you know, a table at a obviously open restaurant. And, you know, there's different things. Like even if I'm thinking of, you know, moving or relocating, I have to do my research. Is it safe for me in a town mm-hmm. like that? Um, well, even going to church, like, am I going to go to a church where they talk, have these conversations? And so we have all those things. And then there's microaggressions too, that are like small acts of racism that don't seem out there. Things like people say to me all the time, well, you don't look like, act like, live like, talk like, whatever, like an indigenous woman. Well, that may seem like you're, you know, complimenting me, but it's really dissing me and my people. So we just have to be cautious in that. But I do have to say, if any of these things um, you know, you, you remember that you did something like that. It makes you cringe. Please be gentle on yourself. There's no perfect person. We're turning a corner. We're, we're all learning and growing together and, you know, just be gentle on yourself. And when we know better, we do better. And that's where we're moving towards doing better. And that, I mean, that's a beautiful thing to say, um, because I do think that there's sometimes people find themselves stuck because they don't know what to do. And obviously they, they have, they, they carry guilt perhaps, and the guilt might not even be about things they themselves have done, but just the system that they're part of and not knowing where to go with that can be really difficult for, for people, um, which leads me on to want to ask you a question because one of the things that amazes me um, is that there is a quest for reconciliation. I think about that. I, I, I think about growing up uh, watching the end of apartheid in South Africa and and watching people. Uh, you know, a hero of my family's was was Desmond Tutu, um, and uh, you know the, the great uh, you know pursuer of reconciliation. I uh, I even went to I did my master's degree at the same university in the same department as Tutu did his, just because I wanted to have something of, of that kind of closeness to to him. And I remember watching some of the the things that the Black South Africans did, and and even as a young person thinking, wow. The fact that that these people would even be open to reconciliation amazes me because there's been so much pain and so much hurt. And yet still there's there's a heart to say, well, could we do better? To hear you say, you know, be kind to yourself. You know, we can we can move towards something good from here. So I'd love to to ask you about reconciliation. Then, like what? What does that look like for you know, maybe for a whole nation, but even just for Christians? What does what does reconciliation potentially? What would your dream of that be? Well, you know, reconciliation is a buzzword, and a lot of people are talking about it. And you know, of course, people are so nice in Canada uh, that we want to work towards that. And that is a million dollar question: like, how do we move forward? How do we do this? And I would invite us all to say reconciliation starts with me. Mm-hmm. And let's stop saying, what can I do for Indigenous people? And let's start yeah. saying, what can I learn from Indigenous people? Beautiful. We have so much to offer, and we're not a problem to be solved. So what happened was there were three commissioners that went across Canada. They interviewed 7,000 Indian residential school survivors. The reason we call them survivors is because 50% of the children that got taken never made it back home. If you survived, 90%, 90% ended up with a mental illness, depression, anxiety, addictions to more severe forms. So they actually listened to these stories and compiled a report. And within the final report of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, there's 94 calls to action. So that's a start. There's some calls to the church in there as well. And I think that 
Um, when it says truth and reconciliation, let's not jump to reconciliation. Let's go back to the truth. So it's conversations like this. Learn the true history. Um, you know, wherever you get your books, podcasts, audiobooks, YouTube, type in keywords and start doing your own homework. Um, take courses. Go to, you know, your local library, parks or recreation. The thing that I love doing is go to museums and cultural sites, not just to learn about our history, but our collective history. Um, and buy our art. You know, um, I have so many people that say, can I buy, wear, use, display Indigenous art? And I've asked my artist friends, and their answer is, yes, 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 please. Mm -hmm. Here's the rule. Buy from inspired Indigenous, not Indigenous inspired. Therefore, you are appreciating the culture, not appropriating the culture. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, um, indigenize your spaces in the art. It's Canadian. But even small things, like maybe put a land acknowledgement on your email signature, have, you know, maybe an indigenous coffee cup or, you know, wear an orange shirt or I have an orange pin, beaded pin. Um, just indigenize your spaces. And that's Canadian. And that's like keeping the culture alive. And the other thing is there is this history that's harsh. But let's not focus on that because whatever we focus on gets bigger. Like learn about it, but let's focus on our successes because despite everything that we've gone through, and this really amazed me. It just, it was a big eye opener for me when I started getting interviewed about the graves. And I think you saw me on um, television. I just realized Canada was grieving because we can't imagine that happening. And I thought, I just all of a sudden thought of myself and I thought, I've been carrying these stories my whole life. But despite everything that we've been carrying, despite all of our historical trauma, we are still so kind, so gentle, full of humor, highly successful. So let's look at Indigenous success in politics and business, in art, science, athletics, um, you know, chefs, whatever it may be. Last night watching the Emmys, there was a big Indigenous representation on the Emmys. And I just even just getting goosebumps thinking about it. Watch our films, you know, because we're changing from the old, you know, um, derogatory vision of the cowboy and Indian movies that I grew up with such racism because of that. But now we have a voice. There's film producers and actors and, you know, in every um, uh, facet of filmmaking. And so... You know, that's how we're going to move forward. It's just reconciliation starts with me. And once you start learning the truth and doing your own work, then if you ever hear somebody talking negatively about an Indigenous person, community, or issue, mm -hmm. let's change the narrative. Mm -hmm. And that's how we're going to move forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I love that language of changing narrative. And, and for me, that's that's at the heart of goodness is is just watching those things like even as you said there just you know in social situations when you hear the old narrative ticking around how do you you know i, I was listening to a podcast just recently and, and the lady was saying that they were talking there was a podcast in the u.s and uh, they were talking about you know this challenge of, of just the way people talk about issues of race and and she said she's learned this uh this phrase that in that when she's at family parties, she says, I just put up my hand and say, hey, we don't talk like that anymore. <laughs> and, um, and that's the sort of, you know, just that little, little jar to remind people we can be good. We don't need to, we don't need to do that sort of thing. And, and, and so there's a question, I suppose, as a, as a sort of round out our conversation, Holly, when I think about listening, I think about Rich Viodas talks about the habit of internal examination, you know, about, about how do we how do we spend time in our own prayer life and think about, but where am I needing to do some work when it comes to my relationship with uh, Indigenous people in Canada? You know, so being brave enough to, it's very quick and easy to say, oh, I, I, I'm not part of that. But actually taking a moment to stop and think, how has this affected me and how is it affecting my behavior and is there opportunity for more good which to me seems like a really a really deeply christian thing to do which is to have a little bit of self-examination yeah um you know i think 
one of the very first statements you made um, just now was in the beginning of our conversation, you were talking about justice. Mm. And Amos 5 says, I want justice, oceans of justice. I want yeah. fairness, rivers of fairness. That's what I want. That's all I want. So if God wants justice and fairness, and you know we're looking at the issues, and we're not responding in any other way than responding like 1 Corinthians 12, where if one part of the body's hurting, we all hurt. Indigenous people are hurting. You know, we've had a lot of trauma. And, you know, first of all, I would say, let's pray. I mean, we can never underestimate the power of prayer. Yeah. And, you know, we've talked about this before. One of my favorite words and my deepest desire for Indigenous people of Canada is shalom. Mm. And yeah. that's what my hope is, is mm. for, you know, us to see the true God, not the one that has been represented so poorly, but to mm -hmm. see, you know, the loving, all embracing, um, big creator that we have. And, and so Shalom is my word for sure. Mm -hmm. that, yeah. That, 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 that concept, that Hebrew concept, isn't it? Of wholeness, of peace, of, of, of healthy prosperity, I think is, is, is beautiful. And I, my brain sort of crammed full of Amos 5. You, you triggered a whole host of thought processes there when you said that. And uh, there's that line. I just I just grabbed it just quickly. Where it talks about there are those who seek to turn justice into bitterness and cast righteousness to the ground. That's one of the lines in Amos 5 as well. And then and, and there's this question posed out. Some people don't want justice. Some people want to make justice a source of bitterness. And then in the beautiful poetic way, please go and read, uh, if you're watching this, go and read Amos 5 from start to finish. But then it says there's this God who, who turns midnight into dawn and turns darkest day into, darkens the day into night. And it goes through all this great things about God and how this God is the God who then it builds up. And there's people who are oppressing the innocent and they're depriving the poor of justice. And then Amos 5 it just says this in verse 14, seek good and not evil that you may live, you know, and then the Lord God Almighty will be with you. And I can love that, Holly, that sense of, of, of you know, seek, seek good, not evil. And, and then it rolls from there into the part that you talked about of, of just this pouring down like a river. And I mean, this is the prophetic language of scripture, isn't it? Calling us to, to goodness, calling us to, to, to a different way of being. It's, it's quite exciting when when we realize that the Bible has been telling us this for a long, long time. <laughs> mm -hmm. And, you know, just that's a good way to think of goodness and mm. to sum up, you know, that conversation. We didn't plan that, that, that you mm. know, come to us. And that is so beautiful. Thank you so much yeah. for sharing that. Uh, oh, thank you, Holly. And, and one of the things that I want to say, just as we sort of round out our conversation today, is I, I, I love our conversations whenever we have them. I love that you were willing to allow me to bring this conversation to the whole, to the whole church, uh, but also to say that this isn't just a one-off conversation. So our plan, you know, as a staff, we're, we're, we're wanting to, to work out within our timescales and various coronavirus restrictions. We're going to have you come in and do some awareness training for us. And, and we're really like, I know you and I have talked about this. So, you know, looking for the opportunity as to how do we even help us as a congregation, perhaps with some awareness training and some, some sort of uh, work around this whole subject. So uh, I'm, I'm really saying that more to encourage people to note, we might see you around a little bit more often doing some things for us. Uh, if you don't mind me putting that out there early. <laughs> and, um, well, you know that I've been at Westside for like, 127 years and I'm going to be there for the rest of the day. So, um, yeah, for sure. I really appreciate that. And I want to, you know, encourage people. I, if you like, I have a documentary on my, that I produced on my mom's residential school story. You can find it on YouTube. It's called a mother's voice. It's just basically giving my mother a voice. 
And um, it's a 12 minute documentary that you can share it with your friends, family, social media mm -hmm. to give, you know, humanity, to give a face of a mother mm -hmm. and a family in a story that, you know, we're all really impacted by in Canada. And so mm -hmm. I would just really encourage people to do that. Yeah. Well, thank you. So a mother's voice is the name of that, of that dog. Yeah. It's amazing. Well, Holly, thank you so much for being, for being with us uh, and, and helping us on this journey of, of just such a huge piece that if we're, if we're going to commit to having a culture of goodness, this seems so central and foundational to that. So uh, I hope that, that you are blessed in your time with the conversation with us. And I hope that everybody that engages and, and listens to what we're doing uh, in, this, in this talk just is blessed by it as well. So thank you so much, Holly. Mm, thank you.